why do women scream when they're having sex with a man? Yani, you want to be silk and not cotton. This is vaginas, boobies flashing all around you and then say, hey, sex is totally fine. Hi everyone, welcome to the second episode of the O Collective podcast. We are Diana, Wingsy, Simona, and Eden. And we are all about female intimate wellness and pleasure. As modern third culture kids, we thought it can be helpful to share our experiences and insights and help any girls out there to navigate their way through life. Today we are chatting with Yanyi. Yanyi was born and raised in Germany with her dad from Vietnam and her mom from Malaysia, but both with Chinese origins. She has been living in Shanghai for more than eight years now and has been working as a freelancer in the event and advertising industry. Three years ago, she had an epiphany where she came aware of the current state of our planet and started her journey and interest in sustainability. Since then, she has co-founded a sustainability platform and after she's been looking for fun ways to raise awareness. One of that is King Grace. Welcome, Yanyi. Welcome, Yanyi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the O Collective podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where did you grow up? What are your roots? What nationality you are? Hi everyone. My name is Yanni. Um, I was born and raised in Germany. My dad is from Vietnam and my mom from Malaysia, but both Chinese origins. Um, so I grew up in a very small village. So I think in terms of identity, nationality, it was always a big question for me of like, where do I belong to? And I think that created a lot of insecurity in me actually growing up because I was always looking for that sense of belonging. But I think getting older, I am feeling proud and I'm really feeling lucky that I have that um, to cultural background because I think that taught me a lot of like seeing a lot of things from different perspective um yeah in terms of what I identify with and gender uh, I think I am quite I'm hetero <laughs> but I am actually quite uh, curious to try things out with girls I think what's funny is that I have been dreaming I had like dreams about having sex with girls, but I never actually had done that in real life. So no. maybe you should just try it. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is like a, a sign, a, a yeah. sign of me. Yeah, a deep rooted desire that needs to get to fruition. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so with growing up in Germany and now you live in Shanghai so and also having all of the different cultural insights and experiences that you had can you elaborate a little bit on how you grew up around int intimacy and sex and relationships and for instance how your parents raised you with it or what you saw at school or how you talk to your friends about it and also how you actually see that right now in China hmm. So I think growing up in a quite Chinese family, sex and int intimacy was never really a topic. I think that also created a lot of conflicts because growing up in Germany, Germany is quite an open, I would say relatively open country where sex, I mean, I have friends that had sex like already at a very early stage. I had like boyfriends over, staying over night with them, but that was never allowed from my parents. And I think, especially, I think there was also this expectation of, because I was the first child and also a girl, that as a girl, you have to maintain yourself, you have to preserve yourself. And yeah. I remember my mom would always like tell me like, Yanni, you want to be silk and not cotton. <laughs> so what does that like, mean? No, in the sense of like, you need to like put your out like you need to put yourself out there as like hard to get and not like have sex with everyone because then you know as you're gonna be rough yes exactly ah. you're gonna be treated um badly and i i think in a way there was some rightness about it as in like because i grew up in a small village so there was still the idea of like man can you know fuck around and it's fine but if a girl, if a woman does it, then she's a slut right away. 
Mm. But um, yeah, but still, I think in comparison with like how I grew up about sexuality, I mean, in the family, we were still very conservative about it and didn't talk about it at all. But I think then like through friends, we talked a lot about it. And then, you know, I think we had our first sex class in like fourth grade on like, what are the sex organs? How to put a condom? Um, so there was like an early interest on it uh, already. And I think also in a way I was exposed to sex like through TV a lot. Like, I think in Germany you have quite a lot of like, especially when it hits like 10 p.m. Yeah. We had like those like, you know, erotic like, oh, call call me under this number or like, you know, like some erotic film. So I was exposed to sex in a very early stage already. And I was always super curious about it. And I'm not sure if I actually should say it, but I think I learned about masturbation already way before I actually understood it. Like, I think one of the first memories I have of masturbation was in kindergarten. And that was like not because I knew that that was like masturbation, but it was because it felt good and it actually yes. helped me to fall asleep. <laughs> yes, I actually had the same. I already told the girls before in the, in the, in the previous episode that uh, we were talking about when we discovered masturbation and sex. And I was also compared to the other girls pretty early. Yeah. Yeah, it's something natural, nothing to be ashamed of. Can you remember, that, like, did your parents ever find out? No, that you... oh. never. That was like something that we would never yeah, talk you... about. I mean, I think like the older I got, like now I sometimes have like with my mom only, like talks about like how sex is important, mm. but that pretty much stays at that level. It wouldn't go like deeper. Yeah, yeah, the overall agreement is that it's important, but I feel that our parents feel very awkward once we hit the topic of sex and intimacy. Not even talking about it, just also just like touching your parents is already, or hugging your parents already feels like awkward for yeah. me. Really. Yeah. yeah, I think like for me, I was like, to my, with my mom, we had quite a close, like, I would see my mom naked and she would see me naked. That was fine. But I think it was really more the topic of sex and especially having sex with people. Yeah. Did she ever tell you not to have it or from what age you should have it? I mean, never really like an age, but definitely not in my teens. <laughs> um, I think one of the funny story and I love my mom and I think it's also, I mean, I understand that it's also something that, you know, she got told from her parents probably, but like one of the things like she would tell me, and I think I was still like a kid and I saw it somewhere on TV and I asked her, mom, why do women scream when they're having sex with a man? And my mom was like, because, because it you're hurts, because it, <laughs> because it hurts very much. So, don't do it. <laughs> they know how to scare you off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could also be true. Yeah. Does, yeah. She, does she know that you do kink rays? Um, not in the not the kinky part. Oh. Does she knows you do the raising part. <laughs> exactly. This is maybe a good pathway into uh, also explaining what kink rays is. I think we haven't really talked about that yet. It's having fun, fundraising, and being kinky as you like to express combined together. Actually, it all started from a birthday party. So me and my friend wanted to throw a huge party. And I think fundraising was, has been something that I've been doing like a couple birthdays before that instead of asking friends for giving gifts, I would ask them to help fund for a cause. So we did one like for um, the earthquake in Lombok and for elephants. And then for this one, we wanted to raise for an um, organization that plants tree in China to battle climate change and desertification. But then we were like, okay, 
let's make it also fun and think of a theme around it. And the same year, um, I went to Germany early that year. And for the first time, I went to a sex club in Berlin, a very famous one called Kit Kat. Oh, yeah, that one. Yeah. <clears throat> so, it's where everybody is naked, right? Yes. Or, so, and they have many different rooms. Exactly. So it was because I knew Berlin was always super open. I knew like for a while my friends had been telling me that they like even at normal parties, they would have like sex positive parties where you basically were where it was OK to have sex at parties. Oh. But that sex club is something that is really like made for that pretty much. So you really so you were only allowed to go in if you were dressed up so you had to dress up in very kinky or like in any fetish or as naked as you want actually the more naked the better and you walk in and it's this huge club with different rooms and everyone was just like everyone was just almost naked so you had like penises vaginas boobies flashing all around you and then you had like a big dance floor then you had like dark rooms where you can really like go there just to have sex with random people and then wow. you had bars and then you had like corridors that were themed and yeah so people were able to just like do sexually whatever they wanted and I thought it was so amazing because you walk in there and you see really people from everywhere around the world. And it's a huge club, so you can really imagine like a couple hundred people. Um, and they all feel so confident and like so comfortable to just express themselves in any ways. And you didn't feel judged at all. Did, did you feel awkward first entering it or like what were your feelings before and afterward after you entered it i would because I'm, I'm just thinking about it i'm thinking i would feel super insecure or awkward or i don't know hesitant to go in and then but maybe if you're finally in you're like yolo <laughs> let me just strip down <laughs> yeah i think at the beginning it was definitely a bit like definitely very new I was very curious, but I was definitely very new to just see everyone like being just like, you know, na walking naked around, dancing naked around, having sex around everyone. And at one point I was sitting there having a drink with a friend and we were just chatting about life, catching up. And around us, we had like on one <laughs> side people, you know, having a threesome and in front of us, the guy sucking of another guy's penis and then on the other side there was like some heavy fingering going on and it was just oh, wow. very normal and i think at the beginning you're a bit like i think at the beginning i was a bit like huh maybe you know i would get turned on by that seeing all this but funnily i didn't really get turned on i was more like very curious to see that experience happening around me um so I think I almost felt more like a voyeur who <laughs> was just enjoying watching that. That experience inspired you to bring that to Shanghai. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, I knew that we couldn't do exactly that in Shanghai. Mm. That would never be possible here. But I think the idea of just people being able to show more of their body and feeling good about it um i think that was more something that i wanted to bring over and it turned out that people did really like it so i think we had like almost 90 percent of the friends who actually came up dressed up and you know we asked them to just like come in their own interpretation of what kinky means and some would wear the hottest you know the zoo and then we had a lot of guys who came uh, dressed up as women. I mean, we had more guys wearing high heels, I think, than women <laughs> that <laughs> night. Um, and it was super fun. And after that, people kept asking when would be the next kinky party. So then I was like, oh, there is actually real interest in there. And then 
So I was looking at, okay, what are the elements? And I think one element was still the fundraising thing that was more important to me that I think, you know, to be able to actually raise awareness around a cause that is in China and also help funding for that. And then on the other side was really the idea of like um, kinky, but under another sub theme. So we had like, uh, we had like cyberpunk and disco and then people could go, you know, crazy and creative with like how they interpret that. And then kind of trying to create that safe space where people could really go in and show them off and feel not judged by it. And yeah, I think this was then how King Race pretty much was born. So if, if Berlin Kit Kat was you know what you all what you just named like people like naked and dressed up and having sex that was then let's say that was a 10 what number on the scale are the king race parties in shanghai or like these type of events how would you scale it like how would you how does it compare to Kit Kat? i think it would be three or four <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i think that's really more only maybe even the dressing is still relatively, you know, uh, more on the safe side. Um, yeah, so maybe probably even three. And it being a three, like the four of us, we actually went to your party last time. I think it was in August before Simona left back to Europe. I felt super underdressed. Everyone was super dressed up. I've seen girls with their nipples out and with just the tape over it. I mean... For China, I think that's a level nine. <laughs> For China, definitely, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, I do see like how awesome King Grace is and how you've created this like liberating environment where people can dress up as whoever they are and they can feel extremely comfortable in just that enclosed environment and safe environment where no one's taking photos of each other. And if photographer if photographers are taking images, it's with the consent of the people that are attending. And I find that super comforting for the fact that in a place like Shanghai, um, where a lot of things are under the watch and rules for the goods, um, people can still find a safe place where they can go and experience and express themselves. Mm, I agree. I think like in China, it's still, I was talking to one of the guys who was in one of the King Race, he was doing the bondage performance. So he actually had like deep insight into, you know, this whole scene and what is actually allowed and not. And he was telling me, for example, in China, you are not allowed to show nudity at all mm. or having sex that's completely illegal. Yeah. So I think we for that reason, you would never be able to go that far already. I just remember because I actually messaged Yanni a few weeks ago because in the party that you had, there was um, like bidding for for a stripper. <laughs> um, and I actually got it for my friend's birthday a few weeks ago. And it was so crazy how difficult it was to have a place where that could happen because a lot of venues won't allow it and the the stripper, the dancer themselves um, was very like cautious of where they would do it um, mm. because, and then I was thinking kind of like, that's so weird because you could easily say that's your friend who just likes to take their clothes off and have a good time. <laughs> but it's just a very sensitive place. And it's not like you're having sex with them and they're not showing their genitals, but they're just doing this act of that potential you know, part of the sexual intimacy that becomes kind of a weird blurred area. Yeah, totally. I think that's definitely also something like when we, so what the, uh, the drag queen who was our um, moderator, our host the last time, um, they were telling me because they've been also trying to organize more kinky events in China where they actually you know, go into bondage and people and like whipping people and everything. And everything has to be in a very controlled environment. So there's always like 
Yeah, you have to really play safe. It's always very, I think, risky to get out of because you could just get in trouble with. Yeah. Well, we're talking about this, right? And then they're like, you know, growing up in Germany, what you mentioned earlier, and and also what we see now with king grays in China, that they're different rules how the country um, treats sex and nudity and sex in public do you th- how do you think it has affected how people view sex I think what I see for example in Berlin like and also what because I've been living here in Shanghai for so long already so it's more like only if I go back and visit and I hear from friends that you know Berlin is a place where it's super, super open. Like even compared to other German cities, it's one of the op- mo- most open cities there. And I think there was like a time where, you know, people are way more open also in like trying out things. And then when it came with the whole like genetification, um, you know, one of my friends was telling me that you know, when you had to fill a form, instead of just like, uh, you know, being a woman or a man, they already had all these different um, categories for you to choose. And also, you know, in terms of prefer- sexual preferences, you had also, you know, 10 of them, and I wouldn't even know half of them. So I think in comparison, I think Berlin is a place where it's very open and encouraged to just like go out and do it. And I think there's probably less judgment around it whereas I feel here because everything is so close up that I think in a way people probably do and I see it in myself as well like there is a desire to express that but because you don't have that safe space you don't feel really comfortable to do it either Mm -hmm. and I think like King Grace for now I think there's more foreigners than Chinese. So I think probably also in terms of foreigners, maybe they're more exposed to that. So they're more also comfortable to, you know, show their nipples more and stuff. Whereas like, I think Chinese maybe haven't been exposed too much to that. So they haven't got that level of uh, where they feel that comfort yet of doing that. Yeah. Like for the for the people that were Chinese, originally Chinese that came to your parties, um, what was their reaction? Oh, some were shy and were more like curious of what that is. I think a lot of them were more curious of what that is. So there's, I think, a lot of curiosity around it. Um, but some of them were also totally not shy at all. Once they saw that everyone was like this, they kind of felt like, OK, I can be the same. Do you think that the younger generation would be interested in these type of, I don't know, parties, interests, like stepping out of the comfort zone? I totally think so. Especially like those who have also been out of China. And like for instance, I there is actually a club, and I'm not sure, I heard they kind of closed down but reopened again, but they were also uh-huh. kinky parties. But Downtown? I think that was like on Julu. Oh, yeah. 151. Not 158, but across 158. Exactly. That, that's yes. Small. Yes. I haven't really got a chance to go there, but I really like to check it out. And I heard there, they are actually trying to be really more kinky and like where they really go, you know, into like whipping people and like where I guess things are actually getting more. Um, yeah, there's more action yeah. involved. Yes, the last time I went there, I remember going into the smoking room and then I was just casually there smoking my e-cigarette. I don't know if I should be saying this, but smoking my e-cigarette and a dude behind me had his hand reaching down a girl's boob and just resting it there while smoking his cigarette. Looked back, I was like, oh, she also looks okay. She's enjoying it. He's enjoying it. Cool. But, I just that, kept doing that, my thing. Doesn't that more come close to, I don't know, like a guy just touching a girl's boob and then she doesn't want No, it to... seemed like she actually okay. gave him consent. Like, okay. it, she okay. didn't seem like she was uncomfortable at all. And also knowing the environment of that place, um, 
I kind of expected it. So it seemed like people there were just open to do whatever. And that for me also feels a little bit liberating. Of course, I will. I always have my eyes out for like, hey, did, does he look uncomfortable? Does she look uncomfortable? Either sex looks uncomfortable. No, I think people were just accepting what they were getting, and it was reciprocated. <laughs> um, so that for me was. Uh, I've only been there once, and that was extremely interesting. Yeah, I would definitely like to go and check it out. I think one of the thing is like. Like for example, in in、uh, Kit Kat, one of the I guess underlining rule was consensus. Like that's what you were also mentioning. And I think over there, what I thought was quite impressive was that even though there was like the space where it seemed like everyone was just like you know free to do whatever there was, but I think there was the underlining rule of consensus. So people were pretty respectful. Like even. You know, a guy came to me, and he would actually very shyly ask me first, or、uh, you know, who I am, and you know, meet me and everything, and ask before he would was allowed. Like I had to actually say yes for him to actually go further, and, and I was observing that for other people's as well. So I think there was like definitely a very strong underlining like knowledge or like idea of like okay. You have to consent to before you can do anything. Yeah, I'm I'm nodding a lot because actually Simona wrote an article just last <laughs> week about BDSM and kink、um, for Mental Health Day, well, Mental Health Day, and one of the key stat was for me it was my first time learning it was that、um, there's a higher percentage of people who actually they have the process of getting each other's consent. In the kink and in the kink and BDSM community versus like the other communities, for example. So that for me was extremely eye-opening, and it like I was nodding because it was so nice to hear you say that. It's like almost seeing a number, but then have an example come to life. <laughs> yeah, I think that that there's something、um, about that because because it's seen as not like the norm. So a lot of people we met that have been into like kink or shibari, or we were Eden and I were in Beijing and we also went to a, like a kink party type of thing. Like the first thing that everyone says is consent. Like the, it's this like understanding that that is incredibly important to be in the community because you're kind of pushing barriers of each other's you know space and、um, ways of communication. So I definitely. Have always felt safe in all of those environments more so than in some parties that I've gone to, that were just supposed to be regular parties, you know. And so I think that's definitely like a really interesting, like I guess it's an unspoken understanding of everyone just needing to ensure that you feel safe because what you're about to do is is not the norm. I think that's super interesting what you're saying because it's so true that like you know. You sometimes you are in a club, like in a normal club, and then you suddenly feel a hand on your ass or something, and it feels like you know almost like they feel entitled to just do it without your consent. Whereas like over there, there's just like this mutual respect and really making sure that is this mutual consent on both sides. Is there anything in what? German boys and girls can learn from how Chinese approach sex and intimacy, maybe even king. There's one learning. Tim Ferriss, the guy of the Four Hour Work Week, he actually also recorded a podcast about it. Is and it this is a Chinese finding that、um, for men, the more you ejaculate, the shorter your life. What and it. It's not bullshit. It's like there is some scientific evidence for it. Like men who like have a lot of sex, who also who masturbate a lot, has an impact on your overall health and longevity. And they, from research, it also and it is Chinese me is it's TCM traditional Chinese medicine research that showed the results that you have a longer life if you don't do it too often. 
as a man. Sounds a crazy. That's my learning. That's, That's like ridiculous. Learning. That's like not a learning. <laughs> That's so it's horrible. a learning. Like, it's it's horrible. Like, we should not like <laughs> we should not have sex anymore if you want to live longer. That doesn't even I'm matter. never telling Greg that. <laughs> Um, I think that's maybe my learning and it's not even like necessarily for my parents or from living in China. This was from a podcast from people who were interested in Chinese medicine. So, yeah. I want to check that source. <laughs> I don't know it was connected to uh, a TCM. There's actually a lot of hidden health knowledge within the traditional Chinese medicine world that we in the West don't even know about, you know, we solve everything through a pill or through an operation, but there's so much more that, you know, that is connected to your body. I have and a funny story about that. My colleague, he just went to do Chinese medicine, um, like where it's like burning on your back and they burnt his back, his like <laughs> whole skin. But then they said it is because he's too, um, it's too cold. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. like he has too much moisture in his body, which is a negative thing in, in Chinese medicine. And then he was like, oh, okay. And it was hurting. So he finally went to the doctor and they're like, oh, you have like a first, like a first degree burn. Like, <laughs> and, and now it's infected. And so, I don't know. I feel very skeptical. <laughs> I mean, some of the Chinese system also believe like by eating, I don't know, a rhinoceros horn, you, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. get like better yeah. erections and stuff. So Yanyi, you've, uh, you were raised in Germany. You come from, similar to us, a uh, traditional Chinese background. Um, you've experienced a lot uh, from a sexual perspective. You've been organizing King Grace now for uh, a long period. How has your view on sexuality changed versus when you uh, were, were a bit younger, when you grew up versus where you are now? Growing up in that you know, very conservative idea around sexuality, I think I was mentioning earlier, there was always a bit that conflict of like, you know, what was taught and expected as a girl that yes, you need to you know, preserve yourself, you shouldn't have sex. Um, with many men um, and that versus like my inner desire of actually very, being very curious about sex and you know, enjoying it. I think at a younger age, I felt very conflicted about it because on one hand I enjoyed it. But on the other hand, there was like this voice of like, oh no, you shouldn't be doing this. Uh, you're disrespecting yourself. Uh, you are you are being cotton now, um, and I think growing up um, now at this stage, I feel way more comfortable about it and actually accept that it's okay to have sex and it's okay to actually really enjoy it and there is no stigma to it if I want to have sex with different men. Um, so that definitely was one of my biggest growth around this. I think one of the funny story actually um, that I think really reflect that conflict in me was that, so I never had a real one night stand where I would meet someone in the club and then, you know, same night we go home and have sex. And I had three trials <laughs> and those three trials completely failed because so you're in the club it was all good you flirted and it was getting all hot and then at one point the guy would be like okay let's go home and I would even say okay let's do it and I was like in my mind I was like okay I'm gonna do it today I'm gonna do it tonight and then so with one of that um I was already in the room and we started kissing and he was starting to undress myself and then suddenly in my mind I was just like no, Yan, you can't do this. Cotton. Cotton, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cotton. And I really told him, like, I'm sorry, but I need to go. And I just ran off. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. So then, then it seems that the belief that you grew up with is strong. Stronger than you thought it was. Yeah, totally. Okay. And I think still sometimes I think it's still there. I mean, now I have a boyfriend, so it's different. 
but mm -hmm. I think, yeah, as a single where you were more able to just go around um, and should have have sex if you want to, but definitely that voice was always somehow lingering there and telling me not to be cotton. <laughs> That's so funny like, because, like, from my personal experience, I feel like I've been in situations like that as well. Um, and then it, when I'm thinking about it and I'm like, oh, you should not do it, blah, blah, blah. But then there's a part of me that convinces me to just do it because I'm like, oh, we've like already committed this far. Like he deserves this. <laughs> like, I'm, you know, like he's worked so hard and I already, like I shouldn't be a tease and I should just do it and then I, I would do it so that's yeah, so yeah. funny and I think that's maybe a sign of like I don't know moral compass or different values You're too kind too kind, know, to like, okay. kind. Yeah, I'm just being too nice um but I always think about that I'm like oh uh we he's like put so much effort at this point and like we're already at like we've already gotten a cab and gone to this location like we might as well just do it now like Dana, the, you sound like you're doing charity yeah like <laughs> I'm like yeah, this, I might, yeah he deserves it and then so and then yeah, yeah you you should just think next time cotton yeah that's, no, I, that's I need your, to have your work cotton, cotton. I they didn't grow up with voice. like people telling me about like a silk and cotton, the differences. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, but Yanni, I'm very curious. So, like, because of your upbringing and then now knowing like how that has impacted you, even to this day, um, what would you do if, like, how would you educate your future kids um, if you have them? around the whole topic of sex. Yeah, I think I definitely would say sex is totally fine and that <laughs> you should have it as much as you want. <laughs> you won't die. I love it. I love you it. Die. <laughs> What's the proper age? Would you would you like have an age limit or like what if they're like 10 years old and then they're like, Ma, I'm masturbating. How would you feel about that? <laughs> I mean, I masturbated at, I don't know, four, so I think with 10, that would be later. That would be nothing. <laughs> I think for me, it's more about how, it's more like teaching responsibility. I would teach responsibility to my kid to say like, okay, look, you can get pregnant if you don't protect, you can get STDs if you don't protect. So just be, you know, conscious and aware about these things and responsible but definitely if i think if they want to try it out and have sex and i think it's also having like this early conversation about it because i think there was like so much like the secret thing around sex and that especially like from my parents that i was i shouldn't have sex already and obviously as a as a rebellious kid, you want to do exactly that. And I think to just have that open conversation, I hope that will actually help to just, yeah, make my kid more responsible about it, but still be able to feel okay to do it and free to express. Yanyi, would you um, start a conversation about sex with your kids or would you wait for your kids to come to you? I don't have kids yet. I, I don't have them. I'm bombarding her with questions about kids. Yeah, she's like, I don't even want kids. <laughs> yeah. I do want kids. <laughs> I think since they will probably learn sex somehow in school already at 10 years old. And that's like when I learned about sex in school. Probably around that age, that would be a good time to talk about it. Would you give your daughter a vibrator? I will cut this out if this is not like the answer but that I want. <laughs> I'm not thinking of like at what age, but I definitely I think would be happy to. I mean, just already for the joke, it's like I'm a cool mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but also to just make it probably more normal about it. Well, what, what, do you, what do you what do you think you would tell your younger self now 
that you're older and you have a, a lot more open experiences. Um, any any like tips or advice or just things to know that you would remind yourself on how to go about yourself at a younger age? Yeah, I think it all comes down again to just that it's okay to do it, that there is actually nothing bad around it and that I shouldn't feel ashamed about it, especially not ashamed about myself because I think at the end that was something you know, that feeling ashamed of you know just going out and have sex and that was like the deep voice that would be always there and I think just taking that shame out is something that I would definitely like to tell my younger self. Do you think you'll tell your kids about uh, silk and cotton? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> that traumatized me. And I'm yeah. not going to do that. Is this, by the way, something very Chinese? Do all Chinese kids know about silk and cotton? I've never no. heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> okay. Maybe it's Malaysian. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you have you have you heard about um, if you have a lot of sex, your nipples turn dark? Is that something that you know? No. No. It's also something that my mom told me. <laughs> <Huh>? What? <laughs> All the lies. All the lies. Yeah. And the thing is like, you know, like now looking at it, even though it's like so wrong, but I can't, I mean, I can't be angry at my mom because I think she actually believed that as well because she yeah. was taught that way. And mm -hmm. I mean, for her, my dad was, her only, you know, guy who she slept with. So she doesn't have any other experience and wouldn't know differently. Yeah. And then she was also not, she didn't have the upbringing that we had. Like she exactly. just grew up in China or Vietnam or Malaysia. Malaysia, oh, sorry, Malaysia. Yeah. She's also quite religious country in, in general as well. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, I, have... I, I also had just one more question. I'm curious because oh. we were talking about like King Craze and you're opening this community, like you yourself, or if you're comfortable to share, like what kind of kink are you into? And like, how did you get into, you know, trying to open it up for other people? Only if you're comfortable to say. <laughs> well, actually I haven't been really that kinky. And I think King Craze, was really more a way for me to start that journey for myself. Okay, cool. I think that as I was telling you, like, you know, I, I didn't even have like a you no know, real one night stand. <laughs> yeah. And I think because of that, you know, and then having, you know, in Berlin being in the sex club, and I think all these things was kind of my, you know, active way of like, okay, just go and try it and be open about it and see how you feel about it. So I think with that King Grace was, yeah, at the end also like kind of for myself to kind of step more towards it and yeah, open that world up to me as well. That totally makes it, I think for all of us, for the old collective as well as the same thing is we, some of us were more sexual and, and open than others, but I think all of us have walked away. Well, not walked away because we're still doing it. We haven't walked away, but we <laughs> up to this point, like it's it's actually been a bigger eye opener and helping us exploring ourselves and better knowing what we want and, and need. So mm -hmm. it's been a fun journey. Yeah, taking up a lot of your time. So yeah. it was a little bit more than 30 minutes, but there was so much to talk about. It was super fun. I really yeah. loved it. And I really just <laughs> felt very comfortable i just felt like yeah we're just you know about friends just talking yeah. about sex well we should we should be able to have these type of conversations and it shouldn't be awkward or anything at all yeah i think this is also something it takes like courage and just a push of yourself to do it but i think you know talking about trying to like talk openly about it it's also like in a way my like my push to be more open about it, even though I still have that voice of like cotton, cotton and shame. 
I think it's also the environment, right, where you're in. I think it also depends a little bit on on the people that you're with, and you you kind of always feel in the first five to ten minutes whether these are the people that you're comfortable with sharing a bit more about yourself uh, versus if you're with a group of people that you think might judge you a little bit uh, of, of what you're doing actually. So I do feel like there's like certain environments where people feel more comfortable in in sharing. Yeah, that's very true. We're just very nice people. You can share everything with us. <laughs> yes. Give us all your dirty secrets. <laughs> Danny, thank you so much for being on our second podcast. Uh, we love what you shared about King Grace. We are looking very forward towards our King Grace TOC event. Uh, thank you so much again. And we hope to see you soon again on our podcast. Yeah, me too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Cotton, cotton, cotton. <laughs> oh, oh my fucking god. Oh my god, I'm so bad at this. I'll go look for if there's wine in the fridge. If there's okay. wine, I'll. Ugh.